correspond with work that we're doing in the Azimuth vein, uh, as far as I can tell. Now, in terms of complications, I've already talked about a few of them. We've seen iatrogenic vein injury, we've seen thrombosis and restenosis. I think that's a complication we all have to be aware of, all to be prepared to deal with when we start doing these cases. Um, we've seen self-limited headaches, um, much like have been reported by Zamboni. Interestingly, we've also seen um, two patients with a sustained arrhythmia, and it's not for what we think it would be. It's not the catheter and guide wire passage through the right atrium. You know, we're all familiar with that from pulmonary angiography and other work that we do. Instead, both of these patients had a sustained tachycardia during catheterization and manipulation within the azimuth stain. So this may be due to vagal stimulation or, or some other reason, but we've seen that. It did break eventually. We observed both of these patients overnight, and both of these patients did break eventually. But um, right now, we've seen two of those patients, and I think it's just something I bring up so you can um, be aware of it and make sure that your patients know about this possibility before you start. Now, those are the lessons learned, but I think almost more important are the challenges. So, I think the first challenge that we have to face is really understanding the role of pre-procedure and post-procedure imaging. We saw great pictures this morning. I think there were two terrific talks on the role of pre-procedure imaging, most notably MR. And I think MR has a, has a great deal to add to, these, to the procedure in this care. But right now, I just think from a center-to-center -center, um, perspective, it, oftentimes we're seeing a lot of false positive MR, MRVs. And I think we have to call into question some of the techniques that are used around the country. And, and frankly, around the world, you're looking at MRV and understanding that there are limitations to that technology. Similarly, the ultrasound is a great screening tool, but when I hear about any tool and use any tool where only one person in the world can confidently perform it, I get nervous about that. Because I think that there's a lots of opportunity for, again, falsely positive or falsely negative results, and I think we all have to get on board with understanding the ultrasound technique and making sure that we are doing it the right way before we rely exclusively on it. Now, in terms of um, post-procedure imaging, I'm wrestling with this as well because I think right now I'm having, I, I understand the need. With any intervention that we do, we want patients to be imaged either with ultrasound or some other technology to understand if the intervention that we perform is open. And I think that's important, and please don't misunderstand me. I, I think it's very important. However, I'm stuck because I know deep inside that I'm not going to re-intervene on a patient who is symptomatically doing well. So any patient that gets imaged just prophylactically or routinely after this procedure and then calls me and says, hey, you know, I, I, I'm doing great, but I had an ultrasound and it shows that I have another stenosis or that I've re-stenosed, my first question is going to be, how do you feel, Michelle? I'm going to ask you, how do you feel? And if you tell me <laughs> that I feel great, the likelihood is that I'm not going to intervene on you, that I think I would be very hesitant to, to go back in and treat someone who's symptomatically doing well. So I think that therefore begs the question as to whether or not we should wait to image until patients have a problem. So I think right now we are in a learning phase. I think it's reasonable to want to image these patients to understand what they're looking like after and understanding the response to what we're doing. But I think in the back of your mind, before you really go crazy about imaging and fighting insurance companies and various things, just ask yourself if you're going to fix it um, no matter what the imaging shows or if you're going to wait until the patient symptomatically warrants Reintervention. I think many times that will help you determine how important the imaging is. Now, one of the, or if not the biggest challenge in this whole thing has been managing expectations. Everyone who we have seen has been wonderful. This patient population is terrific to work with. I think it, it is refreshing. Um, a patient earlier said that it, it's a paradigm shift where the patients know more. Um, than the doctors do. It's been extremely rewarding working with that type of patient population. They're all saying the right things. When they come to see me in my office and when I'm speaking to them on the phone, they all know exactly what they're saying. They know it's new. They know they have reasonable expectations. They know that, you know, it, just a little bit of improvement will make them happy. You know, I think they're saying all the right things, but the problem is that deep inside, sorry, everyone is kind of lying a little bit. Because deep inside, what all the patients want is for their MS to go away. And I understand that. You know, this is a difficult disease for any patient to have. It's a chronic disease, it's a debilitating disease, and everybody wants something to improve the quality of life. And, and I think that the reality that, that we, as the physicians providing the service, have to talk about with our patients is that the cure is probably not going to happen. That we can help with some of their symptoms. I've been very impressed with what we've seen clinically. I feel very confident in telling patients that we're going to help you, 
but I know deep inside many of them are going to be disappointed, and I think it, it's crucial for us to, to learn the right way to manage expectations, and, and whether it's through the patient-driven websites or our own physician-driven websites or meetings like this, it's important to get the word out about what this procedure can do and, and probably what it can't do. So, you know, I think that it's critical. I think it's also important that every patient needs to know that not everybody responds to the procedure. That is a message we have to get out, and it has to be loud and clear to every patient. And, and I think the other challenge is that we're treating an entire community. And yes, it's an interaction between a physician and a patient, but the reality is, and, and if you haven't been involved with this, get used to it, is that it's an interaction <laughs> between a physician and an entire community of patients. I mentioned Denise before, I, I hope I don't embarrass her by saying that she keeps uh, an appointment book of my patient, she knows when they're coming before I do. So she comes, you know, regularly to our centers to say hi to our patients, which by the way is a HIPAA nightmare. And, and say she, goodbye to him first. She says hi to the patients, and then she says, hey, by the way, you're treating uh, Joe next week. You know, tell him I say hi, I can't make it. And, you know, so these patients are very much, certainly the patients who are early adapters with this technology and this procedure, you know, are very much aware of what everyone else is doing and understanding the results that are being seen worldwide. Again, probably better than we are. Um, so understand that whether it's Facebook or the various websites that are available, there's a lot of information out there for the patients and do not assume that they don't know it because they do. Um, so I, I think clearly, um, in conclusion, there are going to be, and, and as many centers know, there are obstacles to broad acceptance and broad performance of this procedure to treat CCSDI and MS patients. Um, but ultimately, uh, excuse me, but I, I think the good thing before I get into my, my final comments is that this is something we as interventional, as interventional radiologists and interventionalists have seen before. And we know that any new procedure, um, there's three ingredients for success. The first is physician champions. The second is patient advocates. And the third is a strong research agenda. So I think it's important for all of us, maybe as those that have gotten out a little bit ahead of the curve, to really set the research agenda and to understand what it's going to take to make sure that these patients are treated with something that we already are seeing do wonderful things for these patients. And that's my last point, is to not forget that we are dealing with the patients and, and that we're trying to help their symptoms. And while it's an interesting procedure to perform, it is essentially a life-changing event for many patients. Just a couple of comments from some patients. It didn't take a single day for me to get like this. It was understanding it'll take time to repair and work well in someone who's seen significant benefit after this procedure. Sorry, presentation flow problem here. Um, again, I don't have the words to express my heartfelt thanks to you giving me my life back. I want to live my life and my, uh, my general overall well-being is back because of the changes in my body. And finally, in general, I feel that I'm healing instead of just continuing to fail. So I think that there's a huge amount of optimism with every patient that we're treating. We're seeing wonderful results. And I just want to again thank Sal for the opportunity to speak here, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.